Hi, today we are at Satago, an interesting startup, and next to me is sitting Steven. Steven, who are you and what do you do? So, my name is Steven Rennick, I'm the founder of Satago, and Satago is a platform that automates credit control for small businesses and freelancers to help them get paid faster. Ah, okay. And how did you come up with this idea? Well, um, it's an idea I've had for years. Um, my motivation for starting it is that I've got a family business back home in Scotland in the construction sector. And the construction sector is notorious for late payments. Um, so it's something I grew up with. And I've always had this uh, desire to try and build something to help small businesses like my family business um, get on top of their late payers. Okay, and um, what did you do before you started this Satago company? Oh, well, my background is very eclectic. Um, immediately before Satago, I was working for Rocket Internet in London and Berlin, launching e-commerce companies around the world. Um, before that, I did an MBA at Oxford University, and before that, I was actually a research scientist. So I did a PhD in genetics many years ago, and then worked in the pharmaceutical sector. Oh, interesting, okay. Briefly describe how the business model of Satago works. Well, it's quite simple. It's uh, software as a service. Mm -hmm. So um, companies pay uh, monthly to use Satago to automate their credit control. The price basically depends on the size of the company. And because we integrate directly with accounting software, it depends what uh, type of accounting software they use. Um, there's a free level if you're using a very low level mm -hmm. um, and also we work with um, credit management agencies as well. Okay. Um, Satago effectively becomes a CRM for them and they use it with their own clients. And what is your current status of your company? Are you already launched or um, are you, I don't know, making millions or trillions of dollars in sales? Um, no millions yet. We're very, very early stage. Um, we basically uh, announced our uh, first kind of major round last week. Um, the platform's been open for a few months, but really we kind of launched it properly uh, last week for the first time. Okay, great. Um, tell us more. What are your plans for customer acquisition? So how do you, what are, what are the ta target customers of, of your platform and how do you plan to target them? And maybe what are the proposed or hypothesized uh, most efficient marketing uh, channels? Mm, that's tough because that's something we've got to find out. Um, in theory, any company or freelancer is a potential user for Satago. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that's a pretty big market. You know, just in the, we're only targeting the UK to start off with. Okay. And obviously that's, that's 2 million SMEs uh, plus 2 million freelancers. We can't target those. Um, now, because we um, act as this kind of CRM for credit managers, also for accountants to help them manage their, um, their own customer's credit control, um, our proposed sales model is that we actually target the credit management um, agencies and the accountants. So we become a tool for them to help them work with their customers and that gives us a much smaller subset of people that we can target and then each one of those can introduce us to dozens or hundreds of their own clients okay. to use the Tago. So you would target the, the, the people and uh, who are uh, advising their, uh, their clients yeah. and also are you also targeting like software, uh, like um, uh, enterprise resource management uh, systems like SAP for uh, SME companies to make a um, plugin or something like that? Um, well, we're not really targeting SAP. People use SAP because we're effectively a kind of um, SAP type product for the SMEs that don't already use it. Okay. Um, so in that respect, a more typical partner for us is the accounting um, companies. So uh, the likes of uh, Free Agent or Sage or Cashflow, they all um, build their cloud accounting with APIs so that people like us can build third-party applications. They then have app stores where they promote these applications. So they're the sorts of partners that are good for us because they want to build their ecosystems as much as possible by having add-ons and we want to get access to their users. So if you go to Free Agent or Sage just now, you'll see we're in their app store and their uh, teams will promote us if one of their um, users says, you know, what do you have in the way of credit control? They can say, well, We've got this within Sage One, but we've also got an easy integration with Satago, who's one yeah. of our partners. Understood. Uh, let's talk about briefly about a corporate strategy. So, how do you perceive, or what is your plan of attack for creating a competitive advantage, and uh, who do you perceive your main competitors, and why do you think you can outcompete them? Well, perhaps the main competitors are the accounting platforms themselves. They've always got 
a bit of basic credit control functionality built into them. Um, but we are essentially taking that to the next level. So, you know, for the accounting firms themselves, it's a difficult enough task to build good accounting software, so they concentrate on that. Um, and that obviously gives us the advantage that we can concentrate on just doing the credit control and making that the, the, good, um, the good part, um, doing it better than, than they can do already. I mean, long term, um, I see the market, I see there's a gap in the market for a product like this. Um, You've got the what the accounting firm uh, accounting software can do already. You've got ERP level um, software. You don't really have anything in the middle uh, for SMEs. And I see Satago as being a bit like um, Zendesk for credit management. You know, Zendesk came in when there wasn't really good um, help desk software out there, and they they kind of owned that market. So now, if you if you want to build help desk into your product. Your first choice is probably going to be Zendesk, and you know that's what, that's what we use as well. But uh, the difference from my perspective for Zendesk, you have a standalone product that you can integrate, mm -hmm. and uh, with the uh, yeah, let's say credit control, uh, it's more of kind of a feature or add-on functionality to a typical accounting software that I can also use. That's why uh, if you if if you're competing with the typical accounting softwares, mm. uh, what happens if they would just add such or a similar plugin? Um, well, it's called like, like that. It's, I wouldn't Can say, I, I no, because you're, you're thinking about credit control and maybe too simply. I mean, credit control is about customer relation management. It's not just that, it's not really just a plug on. Uh -huh. So, you know, within a companies, there you'll have your accounting department, but you'll also have your credit control department. Okay. And that's an, that's an entire separate department. We're building for those people in that, those okay. departments. And that does make it something unique from, from the rest of the, from the rest of the kind of the basic accounting tools. Okay, understood. You have a special story that you uh, told me about that you have some, yeah, interesting uh, story about fundraising. And uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think we're very much the new model of fundraising. Um, <coughs> we were pretty much the first company in the UK to raise um, crowd equity funding. Uh, mm -hmm. We did that through Cedars. So that was late 2012. I raised £30,000 from 60 investors. Um, oh. that, that took about 10 days, that was, oh. that was quite amazing. Um, and I did that as a solo founder. Um, and I used that money to build the MVP for Satago, mm -hmm. just to kind of prove the concept, prove we'd get some interest. Um, that did quite well, it got us into the, oh, it got me into the final of Seed Camp, yeah. and I was on my own uh, there. And everyone said, we like the product, we like what you're doing, we like the market, etc., etc. but we're not going to invest in a solo, non-technical okay. founder. Yeah. I then spent the next five months solidly looking Whoa. for a co-founder because it's not easy finding a technical guy who will want to join you. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's almost a cliche, a business guy with an MBA looking for a technical guy to just build the product. Yeah. Um, but I was very much looking for a partner, not someone to work for me, someone to work with me. And I was very lucky that in the end I found uh, a guy called Adam who okay. was at Palantir Technologies, um, which okay. is a very well known, um, kind of, or it's, it's often described as the biggest Silicon Valley company you won't have heard of. Um, but if you have heard of it, you'll know it's on the same level as kind of Google and LinkedIn and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, he joined me as co-founder. We got into Seedcamp final week again, mm -hmm. and this time we got into Seedcamp. So there we'd done, I'd done Cedars, I'd found a co-founder, and now we were in Seedcamp. It's like, okay, tick box, keep ticking the boxes. Um, and what happened then was that we um, very quickly got some funding committed by BDMI, which is the VC arm of Bertelsmann, yep. um, and that kind of gave us the cornerstone of the of the round, um, and we, we kind of did the I, I started doing the fundraising uh, as as normal, pitching to as many people as I could, and it, it did quite well. We were aiming for um, four hundred thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. We very quickly got over a quarter of that committed, um, but then it kind of it kind of stalled a little bit um, until. Uh, we got featured on AngelList. Mm -hmm. So AngelList, as you'll know, is the very popular angel investor network from the US, just coming to Europe. And um, we got featured on AngelList. I woke up, I saw a tweet saying, oh, Satago's been featured on AngelList. I was like, okay, that's nice. Um, looked in my email, I had about 20 messages wow. from investors. I then was getting phone calls from investors who didn't want to miss out on the round. I had some very famous US firms from Silicon Valley yeah. emailing me asking to get my pitch 
And within about three hours, I had an extra £200,000 committed. Awesome. Um, and it, it very quickly wrapped up after that. So we, we actually went from 400,000 to 600,000. Um, 600,000 went upper limit. I think in total commitments, we probably had way over 700, possibly even 800,000. But you know, it was getting silly. We, didn't, we don't need that much money. We just dilute ourselves too much. So yeah, we'd done, we'd done Cedars, we got into Seed Camp, and now we'd been featured on the Angel List and had the full round. So it was, um, you know, not, I mean, it's definitely not easy, but it was a very interesting experience. Did you do something in order to be featured on Angel List? Or um, it just by luck? Basically? Well, no, it's not luck. I mean, um, the, one of the guys that heads up Angel List in Europe, Philip Mooring, um, knew Satago very well because he was previously principal at Seed, Seed Camp. Camp. Yeah. So, you know, he knew us, he knew the company well, he knew the stage we were at was kind of pretty much, uh, we were maybe a little bit on the early side, but, you know, we'd already got a quarter of the money committed, so we weren't just a kind of uh, a random idea. Yeah. So we were the right kind of timing, and um, yeah, he decided to feature us. I mean, I didn't actually see the email until months after it had been sent out. I thought we were just going to be like one name in a list and a big email. Yeah, that yeah. Actually, it was an email entirely about Satago, which I think everybody on AngelList who'd said they were interested in fintech okay. in Europe must have received this email. Not bad. Eh? Not bad, <laughs> yes. One part that we do is we try to teach our readers about uh, tips from leading entrepreneurs. And uh, you have two interesting yeah, experiences that you made. One of them was crowdfunding and the other one is with finding a co-founder. Mm -hmm. And first I would like to understand um, how, if you have an idea and would like to put it on a crowdfunding platform, can you make sure that you get, like, let's say, 30, 50k? Yeah. So I think you've got um, two ways of hitting your target. Um, all the platforms work in the same model. It's like Kickstarter. If you don't raise your target, everyone gets their money back. Mm. So you've got two options. Either you've got a product which is already kind of out there to some degree, mm -hmm. and therefore you have a crowd of people that are using it, that like it, that you can say to a thousand people, hey, we're raising money and they'll, they'll kind of seed it for you. Or you manage to find the first, um, the kind of the cornerstone money. Um, you'll find that you can speak privately to a few people who say, yeah, okay, I like that. I'll put 2,000 pounds and 1,000 pounds, 5,000 mm pounds. -hmm. Not massive amounts in terms of real angel investing, but enough to make your, yeah. your um, listing stand out. Because according to Cedars, if you get above 30% funding, most of them will close. It's about getting it's about getting the early traction, okay. and you have to. It, it's not a case of just listing it on there and good things will happen. Actually, that's what happened to me. I was lucky. I basically was on there at the when Cedars launched. Um, so you know, it was a, a rising tide, and I was on the ship. So I got, um, you know, I got the just random crowd investing. You know, some people I knew put money in, but not an awful lot. Um, so yeah, that's the two ways. You speak to people, you get them to commit the cornerstone money or you already have a community which you think will probably invest. Will you get a higher ranking if you, let, let's say, have 30% of the minimum invest, total investment? Um, yeah, I mean, that you will get more predominantly featured. Ah, okay. um, because if you just, if, you, if you're in Cedar, I mean, there's, not, there's only like a, a dozen or two dozen campaigns getting funded on there at any one time. And when you go in there, you're all instantly drawn to the ones, which I think it sorts them by who's got the most percentage funding. And you're always drawn to the ones which are doing well because you know, you, you, you follow the crowd, it's herd mentality. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was the same with our investment round. Um, you know, like I said, it kind of plateaued a little bit. Once we got to 70 or 80% invested, um, you know, I was turning investors away on the phone. It was the same with um, Cedars. I got obsessed with pressing refresh. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you see someone put 10 pounds in, it's like, wow, some strange person's just put 10 pounds into my company. And then one time I refreshed it and someone had put 5,000 pounds in, I was like, Whoa! <laughs> Somebody wants to put five thousand pounds into my business, and it just you know it kind of hit that thirty percent, and then kind of travelled steadily, steadily, steadily till it got to seventy percent, and then everyone gets fear of missing out, and then boom! In like okay. six hours, it's done. Okay, understood. And it was this kind kind of equity investment, or was yes. it a grant? A grant. Yeah. Equity. So we gave away fourteen percent equity for thirty percent. Uh, uh, sorry, for thirty thousand, which is you know on the face of it, that's quite cheap, but at the same time. Satago so then was an idea in my head, yeah. uh, a PowerPoint and a video of me sitting on my kitchen floor yeah. describing what Satago is. So, you know, I didn't have the justification to have a valuation much higher than that. Sure. 
and the second part would be a co-founder. What advice can you give first-time entrepreneurs who are maybe not technical to yeah. find um, a technical co-founder? So I get a lot of people asking me that um, because I've written a couple of blog posts about it, which did quite well. So it's worth having a look at my blog if you can find it. Um, but I mean, I can only say what worked for me and you know, you've got to have unfair advantages. And I had several things which made me stand out beyond the crowd. Um, you could argue that some of them aren't necessarily good things, but they worked. I mean, I had the MBA, mm -hmm. I had worked for Rocket Internet, um, I had raised money on Cedars, I had built a prototype, and I had got to the final of Seedcamp. Mm -hmm. So the way I actually found Adam was on a, a startup job board, workingstartups.com. And my title on the job advert was Seed Camp Finalist Looking for Technical Co-Founder. Mm -hmm. So that's an immediate filter, is that they can look at that and say, well, if it's good enough for Seed Camp to at least be a finalist, it's not just some random business guy yeah. with a stupid idea yeah. for a social network thing. <laughs> um, so you need to you need to differentiate. So you, you need to prove that you can do things even when you're on your own. So even though I'm not a developer, I was able to build a... Um, prototype using um, uh, a prototyping wireframing software called Hot Glue. Mm -hmm. Now, Hot Glue is you know it's, it's made for building wireframes, but if you're if you bother investigating it enough, you can actually make a pretty interactive, clickable oh. wireframe, and you can build almost like a, a your super MVP there. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you can do those things and prove you're more than just a guy who goes, "Hey, I've got an idea," it just every everything you can do takes you a step beyond. If you can do that, if you can raise a little bit of money on Cedars, enough to kind of build the MVP, even if it's just like um, the designs, not even the actual working model. Anything you can do to take you beyond the guy with an idea makes you more attractive. And then after that, it's just about using your network as much as possible. So, I mean, I was reaching out through LinkedIn, I was um, speaking to friends, uh, I was going to any events I could. Um, the problem is when you ask other technical people, if they know anybody that would join a startup, they'll pretty much say to you, yeah, you're about the third person to ask me that this month. So there's no getting around supply and demand. Yeah. Um, good technical people who could be co-founder level are in short supply. And okay, understand. And the MVP that you built before you met your, your CTO, uh, was it only like wireframes or did you also have some kind of back end? To no, that? because the MVP that I built before I met Adam was fully functioning. I, because I'd raised the money on Cedars already, I'd had, I, I'd been working on it for about eight months already. And the design, the first design was done, the back end worked. It was a different model because we've pivoted a little bit, yeah. but it, it worked um, properly. You could go in there and, and use it. Um, and that's, yeah. Did you hire some uh, coders? Yeah, or? yeah. So um, I was very lucky in that I, I basically used um, contract developer, um, a, well, a contract development agency. Um, now, the, now you hear a lot of horror stories about the business guy that uses an outsourced yeah. uh, contract development agency. I was lucky that the guys that I picked had already built um, an e-commerce company website for a friend of mine, which had been very successful. It's one of the biggest um, secondhand book, online online secondhand booksellers okay. in North America. <laughs> um, so I trusted that they would be good, and yeah, it's worked out very well. Awesome. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for your okay. time. And uh, maybe next time you can visit Satago.